many of which are in Africa, but also in other parts of the world, such as Asia, Latin America, etc. And uh, we work with victims' communities to help ensure that their rights are respected. Tell, um, how important is it for victims to participate um, in a tribe that, that has been? Well, the, the way victims participate in a trial um, is uh, there's, there's a number of different ways. Um, the traditional way is that a, a victim is a witness. So obviously in a criminal trial, uh, victims play a crucial role because they're the ones who experienced the crime and they are giving testimony. Um, at the International Criminal Court, as well as before many other courts, there is a growing recognition that the voices of victims should be heard not only as a witness, to give testimony about the harm, but also to give their experience of that harm in a broader way in order to, to, to ensure that their voice of what justice should be about is heard. Um, so this broader uh, experience of justice is also something which the International Criminal Court has recognized in its procedures. So really, in an Let's say in a trial, the yeah, testimony is actually the physical evidence. Correct. Um, in, the, in a criminal trial, um, a typical criminal trial will, uh, the, main, uh, the main aspect of the trial will be the testimony of the, the victim, the person who has been harmed by the crime. Right. That will be the main source of evidence. Yes. Um, with large criminal cases, uh, there will also be other kinds of evidence, um, physical evidence, but also evidence of, um, if it involves, let's say, a military official, uh, evidence of the chain of command in the military structure to show how a senior official related to the particular client crimes that are being um, alleged. Right. So it can be quite complex, but victims play a central role as witnesses in these trials. I'm sure that without the reality, um, it's, it's had some of these cases. At least it, their presence you know, uh, makes a difference. A hundred percent. If victims were not participating in these trials, injustice would be certainly evident. We could also ask ourselves, well, why why are we here? Why are we doing justice if not to uh, give support and recognize the harm to victims? So are there times where um, it is difficult or you find, find it challenging to convince um, victims to come forward? Certainly. Um, in many of the countries, particularly that the International Criminal Court is looking at, uh, the conflicts are not necessarily over. There is still a lot of violence and insecurity in some of these countries, and 
victims may be afraid that they may face repercussions by engaging with the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court has uh, measures in place to protect victims and witnesses, but they don't have their own police force, they don't have their own army. So obviously in a very small remote place where there is a lot of insecurity, some victims may feel that they don't want to take that risk. When they don't want to take that risk, to further convince them. Are there resources available to protect them? Right? I mean, if a victim knows various resources that are there, perhaps that might help to uh, convince them to come forward. Certainly. The International Criminal Court has a Victims and Witnesses Unit which provides support to victims who are giving testimony and also victims who are participating in a broader sense for the International Criminal Court. And uh, what the Victims and victim, uh, victims and Witnesses Unit seeks to do is to ensure that uh, evidence about the victim's identity is kept private so that it's not publicly known that victims are involved in the case, but also if for any reason there are problems of security and the victim feels threatened, that this body can step in to try to assist. Say um, after trial, apart from um, the criminal satisfaction that um, the perpetrator has been convicted, can they seek uh, civil redress? Um, before the International Criminal Court, there is a special procedure where victims have the ability to seek civil redress, uh, known as reparation before the court. Um, they have this ability to, um, to, to explain the type of harm that they suffered and so long as it can be shown that the harm that they suffered is connected to the crimes for which the person was convicted, then the court has the ability to afford reparation. Um, some of the challenges relating to the reparation process are that many of the accused persons before the court uh, do not have funds. Uh, so when it comes to enforcing a reward for reparations, there can be some difficulty because the first place one would look to enforce the award is the convicted person, right. but, but that convicted person may not have any funds. One of the solutions or, or partial solutions to that is uh, that the court has set up a trust fund for victims which seeks voluntary contributions from a wide array of sources, including from individuals, and that fund will help to ensure that any reparation awards that are made by the courts can be uh, implemented in practice, even if the convicted person does not have any funds. Assuming it's a government that is involved, can, can, can the court ask the government that is involved? Um, the, to well, an important, an important factor about the International Criminal Court is that its mandate is limited to individuals. So the only cases that can be brought uh, at the International Criminal Court relate to individuals, which can include government officials, right. certainly. We know very well that there are acting presidents who are currently wanted by the International Criminal Court, uh, President al-Bashir. Yes. Um, so in that respect, um, uh, persons in governmental power can be criminally prosecuted before the court, but the court is considering the individual criminal responsibility of the person. It is not cons considering any criminal liability of the state as a whole. So when it comes to reparations, uh, the court does not have the ability to require the states to, to 
make good on a reparations award, though it is hoped, of course, that in each of the countries that are being considered by the international criminal courts, that the countries uh, do step in and provide uh, the widest possible framework of reparations for the many victims, many of whom will never come to the international criminal courts. Now, uh, what are the expectations of the victims? The expectations of the victims vary considerably. As you would imagine, uh, victims come in all shapes and sizes from different walks of life, some, some of whom are living in very difficult situations in the countries concerned, others who have since left the countries and are refugees in, in other countries. So you have a, a wide experience of victims. Most victims are extremely interested in and of itself in the criminal prosecution. Um, others uh, will be interested in their more immediate um, physical, psychological, um, humanitarian needs that need to be met um, given the harsh lives that they, they often have to live. In the first case before the International Criminal Court, the Lubanga trial involves the recruitment of child soldiers. So that is a particular situation when it comes to reparation. What do children want to know firstly that they're not alone, that there are many people who are going through the same sort of thing, and that there are specialized organizations to help. Um, there are organizations within the countries concerned, if they're there, um, and depending where they are in the diaspora, there are specialized organizations that do provide uh, services, both general services as well as more specialized legal or humanitarian supports. So uh, it's important for the diaspora communities to work together and to ensure that people are aware of the services in their own countries. Uh, that could be the first place for assistance. So if somebody wants to reach redress in one thing, how can they reach it? And the best suggestion would be to, to look on our website, which is www.redress.org to get further information. That will give a better idea of the scope of the work that we do and how we might be able to collaborate with diaspora organizations in the USA or anywhere. Well, thank you, Carla, for uh, sitting down, making out your time to sit down and chat with us again. Pleasure. Thank you. You have been watching Carla first time, who is the director of Redress from London. Um, again, please do continue to watch us on this channel, same time and same place.